Welcome back to the 99, where we are focused on brewing a better competitive commander. I'm your host, Patrick Marlad, and there are a ton of announcements to make before starting this video. So let's just jump to it. First and foremost, you are either watching or listening to this video today. This is our official first podcast release. So um, here's obviously a video version. If you're on YouTube, you're watching it now. But if you haven't seen yet, in the description down below, there's a link to Anchor, which also has a link to Spotify, where you can listen to this video instead. So I'll be sure to read off a lot of the cards we discussed today. Some of them are understood, but for the most part, I'm going to go over everything very thoroughly. So in case you're listening, you'll be able to pick up on the combo lines and which cards we're talking about in today's video. Also, I'd like to shout out our partner, TCG Player. It is a global marketplace for cards. They aren't a shop necessarily. They're just an aggregate resource of different vendors where you can find the best prices on singles, packs, and more. So if you wanted to purchase any cards we discussed today, of course, you can do so in the link in the description. And if you do it via that link, you'll be helping out the show. There's a portion of those proceeds go to help fund this programming. Lastly, if you want to help support this programming directly, there are now two ways to do so. If you enjoy podcasts, more over video, then I'll encourage you to hit that support button on the Anchor page. It's a great way to donate to our efforts here, as well as Patreon now. So in the link in the description, it's the top bar. There's a link to our Patreon. There's only one tier right now, and I'd like to expand on the services we're offering there, but you can again donate as little as a dollar or as much as you want via Patreon to help the programming here. You will get access to an exclusive Patreon channel on the Discord where we can chat directly. Of course, your name in the end credits and a shout out during the end credits. So if you're listening to this, you'll at least get to hear one of those lucky few patrons on that shout out page. Moving forward for our patrons, I of course want to expand on the types of goals we have for you all as well as exclusive content. You know, if you're helping support this channel in a big way, making this my livelihood, of course, I'm going to want to provide content for you exclusively. I mean, that only makes sense. So we can do podcast videos, Videos, and of course, suggestions for videos from you guys. I generally work off of what the team wants to work with or what I personally want to work with. But again, if you're helping support the channel, let's talk more about what you want to talk about. However, I think we do an okay job finding topics and commanders to discuss, and this year is going to be a crazy year for Commander anyways. But guys, those are all the ways you can help support the channel. But quick PSA, this is going to date this video, but if you are hurt, if you're in any of the industries that are hurt right now by COVID-19, Feel free not to donate anything. I'll be okay. Make sure you're okay. Make sure your family's okay. Again, thank you for joining me on another video, and let's just jump into this one. Because today we're discussing Anna Fenza the Foremost. Oh, she is one of my favorite Stax Manders, and this is a very Stax forward approach to the girl. And of course, I'm going to read her off in a second. But in the description down below, if you want to follow the primer to get a better look at everything we'll be discussing today, it's featured over on Tapped Out. It's labeled a better Anafenza, the foremost. But Anafenza, she's Abzen, so white, black, green. Uh, 3 CMC for a 4 4 body. What? Human soldier. Ridiculous stats on this girl and some amazing effects. So whenever Anna Fans of the Foremost attacks, put a plus one, plus one counter on another target tapped creature you control. Now it's important to note that this tapped creature doesn't need to be attacking. It could just be one of your mana dorks and or anything that's on the field that you might be using. So hate bears, if they're swinging at that open player, go ahead, put a one, one counter on them. Why not make them more formidable? Um, but the other ability, which is a static effect, whoo, if a creature would be put into an opponent's graveyard from anywhere, exile it. That says, no mo, Flash Hulk. We don't want to see that. You can just say exile to that. Uh, so in case you're wondering, uh, whenever a creature has a die effect, like when they go from the battlefield to the graveyard, this replacement makes it so they go from the battlefield to exile. So if you're wondering if those strategies still work, no. No, that plan is dead. So excellent ability to have on a commander and of course we're doubling down on this effect with one of our stacks pieces as well which i'm going to go into in a few but the whole idea with anafenza at least in my opinion is it's a very blood pod type build but if you're not interested in um, in your partner commanders or you're just bored with them and you want to try something else i don't think this is limiting you all too much do we really need red from blood pod not really I mean, we have all of the tutors we need to efficiently work through our deck. And I find that focusing on fewer colors sometimes opens up new play lines and new strategies so far as stack summons are concerned, at least in this list. 
And that's actually where I want to start today. So the basic plan here is to grind, bury, and reanimate. So at its core, beyond all the stacks pieces, this is a combo deck. And the combo is going to be relying on Razaketh. So if you don't know who Razaketh the Foulblooded is, he's been a core part of many a reanimation strategy in that he can basically unlimitedly tutor, unlimitedly tutor for uh, cards in your deck, depending on a particular board state happening. And it usually revolves around a card called Lean and Relic Warder. But Razaketh the Foulblooded is a five generic triple black legendary creature demon flying trample if you pay two life sacrifice another creature you can search your library for a card and put it into your hand pretty brutal um so the concept here would be to bury him and reanimate him there are points where you can hard cast him very easily and generally when i've played anafenza they usually the, those matches devolve into a slug fest because Reanimation one, it's it's one of the hardest strategies to line up because there's just a lot of counter hate to this type of strategy baked into numerous lists because of the current meta. So you're going to be working against a lot of elements that are going to bog you down. So I find that if we go into a slugfest mode where we bring everyone else's creatures down, slow the board down, and are just wailing on people turn to turn, trust me, a 4-4 four four is hard to beat for a lot of decks out there. Um, you're going to be in a good place. So, so I've found that, generally speaking, I think 60% of the games I've played with Anafenza, they've just devolved into Slugfest. And the other half of the time where I've won, I've been able to get this combo going. And I'm not even going to recommend it's the first thing you do, but the combo lines we'll discuss later, they're very heavy-handed. I'm going to try to go over them slowly so they make sense. But again, the first thing I want to start with is that grind element of this deck. How do we get the board to go slowly. So there are a ton of stacks elements here. I'm not gonna name all of them because that would take all day, but I do wanna start with my favorite pieces, the ones that have like altered the game so damningly for my opponents that there was no coming back. And or are just pieces that I feel are neglected in the stacksy builds. And when you're in Abzen, we'll, we'll take what we can get. And the first one is Archon of Valor's Reach. So. Why I like this card in Anafenza is it's very easy to ramp out. Again, we've got, we're not using fast mana via artifacts, so we're relying on a lot of dorks to power out things, but generally speaking, we've got enough mana to pump this thing out by turn four in general. It's, it's not very difficult to put this guy out. So Archon of Valor's Reach, if you've never seen him, he's Slesnia. So uh, four generic, green, white, uh, creature Archon, five, six, flying, vigilance, trample. He has one of my favorite effects in the whole game. As Archon of Valor's Reach enters the battlefield, choose Artifact, Enchantment, Instant, Sorcery, or Planeswalker. Players can't cast spells of the chosen type. So it's almost like Sanctum Prelate in that you can call out a number and those spells can't be played anymore if they're that uh, CMC. This is so much more wide spanning and again, just damning on the board. Cause 99% of the time, when I say Archon of Valor's Reach, and when he comes into play, he's gonna say instant. Because when I say instant, I'm shutting down most all removal, most all strategies. It's It hits the game so hard because most of, at least our removal, is instant based. The only thing I can think of that is commonly played, that sorcery based removal, is Toxic Deluge. Toxic Deluge, if you don't know what that is, it's sorcery, two generic, one black. Uh, as an additional cost, you have to pay X life, and then all creatures get minus X minus X until the end of turn, right? So if that is the only thing I need to be worried about, and most of their instant speed tutors are gone, again, there's still a demonic tutor. There, there are still tutors to find up Toxic Deluge in that mono black deck. I think you're going to be in a safe spot. Most of those tutors are used early game unless they're pulled mid to late game for a combo piece and they're not really thinking about Archon of Valor's Reach. But every time I've resolved Archon of Valor's Reach, I've won that game. I've won that game. Even in a game where I was gilded draked, my Archon of Valor's Reach was taken from me because it's a flying vigilance trample and my Lin Vala can't do anything about this, which we'll talk about later. Um, I still won because of Finale of Devastation. Like, yeah, that's fine. I'll just do this at sorcery speed and make my army ridiculous, so block me now. But yeah, that, that was another slugfest uh, round. But the thing is, 
We don't rely on instants that heavily. We do have 15 of them. Of course, we have hard removal in our instants as well, and a lot of tutors to include one of our best tutors for the deck in Tomb. So you are shutting down part of your own strategy, but trust me, if it hampers you and hampers three other players, it is totally worth running. Again, this is not a difficult card to push out. It's actually a really good reanimate target as well. And we have ways to cheat him out beyond uh, just the hard cast and having dorks and guys cradle and all that fun stuff out. So Archon of Valor's Reach, horribly underrated. Definitely should be played more often. If you make an, an offense of the foremost list, play, uh, play Archon. Him or her? It might be a her. I think it's a her. Uh, but play the Archon. Fantastic card. The next card I want to discuss is a bit of removal that uh, it's it's I'm up in the air on whether I should be using it or not. It doesn't really hurt our strategy horribly, but it hurts everyone else in a big way. And that's Bane of Progress. I don't like it because it is it feels overcosted. Don't get me wrong. It's totally worth the effect. But in this list, we don't always want you tap out to do things. And this is one of those cards where you kind of have to tap out to do it. Archon of Valor's Reach, it's okay to tap out to say instance can't be played. I think that's okay. But for this guy, he's four generic, two green for a two, two, doesn't seem right. Creature element, he's, I think he's only from a commander set as a matter of fact. So this guy, when he enters the battlefield, destroy all artifacts and enchantments. That includes yours. And we don't have too many, so it's okay. Put a 1-1 one, one counter on Bane of Progress for each permanent destroyed this way. Again, if you're going to Beat Street, this is a great way to get there. So when you put this guy in the battlefield, you can, again, you can cheat him out with certain effects. I, I believe we use um, some tutors that will get this guy out, like the Court of Calling. Uh, is that in here? Am I lying to you? Oh, man. Okay, I'm lying to you. I took that out. Well, there are ways you can cheat him out. Uh, at instant speed if you so choose however for the most part we're going to drop this guy when it's advantageous for us so we're not going to try to remove any of our own hate pieces if we have any out ideally bane of progress is going to be there to slow down the rest of everyone else's game uh, you've seen bane hit the table before it's a fantastic card for this deck and if there are any enchantment creatures or artifact based creatures and anafens is out those creatures get exiled um, which is, you know, it, Eidolon of Rhetoric is a big threat for me. Either Swarm Canonist is a big threat for me. Being able to knock them out and exile them at the same time is fantastic. So there are added benefits to just having this in your list outside of it, just destroying the Ristic Studies, the Sylvan Libraries, the Carpet of Flowers, all of the value pieces you're going to see. So if you want that wide spanning piece of removal, this is fantastic. But moreover, if you're trying to work towards that graveyard strategy and there's a Graph Digger's Cage or something holding you back, this is gonna hit all of them. And it's funny because I'm seeing it more and more. People just play these redundancies. Even if their opponent has their Graph Digger's Cage out, they'll just play their Graph Digger's Cage. And I'm like, well, I guess I gotta work through both of these things now. So why not Eladomri's call this out so I can just drop this guy and destroy all those things. It's a great cure-all to the issue of reanimation if there's a lot of hate pieces for it. And then at the end of the day, you just have a giant beater. So. Why wouldn't you want that? It's funny, I'm talking about giant beaters in, in what I'm calling a CDH list. Uh, but speaking of the Eidolon of Rhetoric, the Aether Sworn Canonist, we have those two creatures and Deafening Silence in our list. Now, mind you, our deck to include Anafenza includes uh, 28 creatures. So we're in a good spot. And our strategy employs uh, sacrificing one uh, creatures via Razaketh to get the combo going and two creature spells to get the combo going. So Deafening Silence doesn't hurt us too much. If you're going to remove one of these elements, I would say this one first, but they all have the same effect essentially. Deafening Silence is one white. Each player can't cast more than one non-creature spell each turn. Aether Sworn Cannon is, you can't cast more than one non-artifact spell each turn. Eidolon of Rhetoric is Rule of Law. Each player can't cast more than one spell each turn. So if that spell is reanimate on Razaketh off of a survival of the fittest. So I use survival of the fittest. I dump Razaketh. I grab whatever the heck I want at this point. Generally like Eternal Witness or, or Lean and Relic Water. You want to get that ball rolling. But you do, you do that and then you reanimate him. That's your one spell. 
you can sacrifice Eidolon of Rhetoric and get past the effect. Again, you can sacrifice Ether Sworn Candidus, excuse me, and get past that effect. Deafening Silence. This is a Creature Matters deck, so we can generally work around some of these issues, but Deafening Silence is the harder piece to remove if it's hampering your combo. Mind you, LED, Lion's Eye Diamond, is a large part of this combo, so this might hamper you, but not in a way that's too obtrusive that doesn't screw over the rest of the game. So Deafening Silence is okay because you can work around it with that combo piece, Lean and Relic Warder. If you want, he can enter and exile that, and then you can play the other parts of the combo before getting him off of the Deafening Silence. Obviously, that's not ideal. You don't want to have to do that. That's another setup to the setup of the combo, which we haven't even talked about yet, but you don't, you don't really want to do that. Deafening Silence might be the one to cut if you're looking at any, any of these, but regardless, these effects are so low cost, so affecting on the game. If you watched our, if you watched my Balan uh, deck, deck tech, which I'll highly encourage, and if you watched him played, Never have I seen more counter spells flung at me, removal flung at me, when you are threatening to put a rule of law effect on the table. It hurts your opponents that much. There are very few decks that win with one cast. Very few. Really, it's just Flash Hulk that I can think of that wins with one cast easily. Maybe if I'm wrong, let me know. So that's why we run these effects. They're, they're always worth it. And trust me, your opponents are going to play against it. Again, <laughs> the last Brew Wars, if that was any indicator of folks banding together to play against you, I never thought Balan would be Arch Enemy, but he was that game. Deafening Silence is, is a pretty big reason why. So, beyond those stacks elements, we use some pretty goofy ones here. <laughs> I like this next one because it's very easy to cheat out. Again, we use a Fauna Shaman, we use Survival of the Fittest, and those are great ways to set up reanimation strategies. So, Let's just say we dump Elish Norn Grand Cinnabite with Survival of the Fittest and we grab our, I don't know, Loyal Retainers. When I play Loyal Retainers and I sacrifice him to bring back a Legendary Creature, I'm getting a 4-7 Vigilance for 5 Generic, 2 White, uh, Legendary Creature Praetor. Other creatures you control have plus 2, plus 2, and creatures your opponents control get minus 2, minus 2. Yeah. Did your strategy revolve around a creature? Not anymore. For the most part, this is gonna kill a lot of threats. It's not gonna destroy everything, but again, if we're trying to take this to Beat Street, which I kinda like doing nowadays, I found that creature strategies, I I find that they're, they're my favorite strategies because yes, while they have some of the most removal against them, especially if they're a uh, creature with two types, like an artifact creature like Aether Sworn. There's just going to be more ways to remove it. Even still, there's more ways to recur it, and there's more ways to play with those effects, especially with all of the tutors we have in Abzan in particular. When we can tutor up so many different types of creatures, we have so many utilities attached to them and board presence. This helps your board pre uh, presence be benefited that much more. Right, so all of our creatures get plus two, plus two, and offense is a six, six now. The board state gets insane with this out. Trust me, people need to remove Elish Norn to play their game. They can't just cheat out an Avon Mind Sensor and screw you over. They can't just cheat out an Ocean Thief and screw you over. That Those pack, those plans are gone. Anything they were trying to do with a creature that's two defense or less is gone. But even worse is the fact that we run a little card called Living Plane. If you want to hard lock out the board, I've never seen anyone come back from this, but if you want to hard lock out the board for two generic, two green, world enchantment, all lands are 1-1 one, one creatures that are still lands. So beyond the fact that this gives your lands summoning sickness, right? So if you play this out early, which I commonly do, play it out early, every land is summoning sick. All those fetch lands are summoning sick. Everything you play is summoning sick. I don't mind so much. I've got dorks. It's okay. So with Living Plain and Elish Norn out, you just destroy everyone's lands and you have an army of 3-3 three, three lands. That's pretty good. No, I have never seen anyone come back from that. Let me know if someone's resolved both an Elish Norn and had Living Plains out and they didn't win the game. 
that that would be very very i mean you deserve an applause that's impressive i don't know how you get over those two cards but yeah it's damning elish norn uh, is generally i'm not gonna lie to you is generally the legendary creature i go to reanimate not necessarily razaketh i find that most board states favor having creature heavy or rather creature based combat damage strategies in this deck it's very weird most of the games I win with this are through combat damage. Can't explain that. And it's because I favor Elish Norn. Um, she's a very good stacks piece uh, for this game, CDH. Uh, it doesn't see much of her and it deserves to see more of her. Uh, but another card that we actually covered in our staples collection. This is another one of those staples in white in my personal opinion that you should be running as an excuse to be in white. Linvala Keeper of Silence. So this also works with Living Plane, if you if you listen close. So two generic, two white, legendary creature angel, three, four flyer, activated abilities of creatures your opponents control can't be activated. So all of those one, one lands, they're creatures now and they can't activate. So in the same way, they screw over your opponent's lands. Mind you, they can still tap to attack. That's the best they're gonna do that game. And I think I feel okay with a 4-4 four, four body and a 3-4 in the air just blocking. Uh, honestly, we'd probably just swing in with Linvala and then keep Anafenza up to block those little guys. Although the benefit of Anafenza being on the field swinging is too high. I think I had an Aether Sworn Cannonist that got 5 plus 1 plus 1 counters one game. Like, it it was stupid. I, I had like a massive army of creatures. If you get Anafenza out on turn 2, just swing with her every single turn. Even with a living plane. Trust me, people don't want to sacrifice their lands in this scenario. They're likely going to want to get rid of Linvala first so they can use their lands for mana. But again, that's one of those scenarios that's, it's a soft lock, but it's a difficult one to get out of. Also, mind you, in the same way that we can retrieve, I mentioned Loyal Retainers earlier, the same way we can retrieve uh, Elish Norn, Razaketh, we can use Loyal Retainers, which is two generic, one white, a creature human advisor one one body to sacrifice him and return target legendary creature from the graveyard to the battlefield now mind you you can only activate this ability during your turn before attackers or um, attackers are declared excuse me uh, that's not such a difficult prerequisite for this to go off and generally speaking um, i've never seen anyone forget that that's how this functions but do bear that in mind you're likely going to want to get that out of the way before your combat stuff let's be honest but yeah, uh, Linvala, fantastic for the deck. Again, if you're playing in white and you enjoy a good stacks piece or two, this one shuts off a lot of strategies. You're going to want to roll with it. The next card we want to talk about is Kataki Wars Wage. Now, this is another stacks element that doesn't get a lot of love. It's been reprinted a handful of times. But Kataki, uh, he's another legendary too. So yeah, you can use the <laughs> retainers on this guy. One generic, one white for a 2-1. Ooh, he's gonna get so much bigger with Anafenza. Legendary creature spirit. All artifacts have at the beginning of your upkeep. Sacrifice this artifact unless you pay one. So let me just go hover uh, over the artifacts we have. We have Lion's Eye Diamond, Monocrypt, Mox Diamond, Soul Ring, Tome of Legends. Fantastic in this deck. And through our creatures, I think it's just Ether Sworn Candidus. Right? Yeah. So that's not the end of the world. We got six things. And you can run more artifacts in this list if you if you so choose. But Kataki Wars Wage, Smothering Tithe, that's a dead card. Any artifact fast mana they have, they're not dead cards, but they're likely paying for themselves or maybe another rock with them. You're shutting down a lot of fast mana this way. It is totally worth it. It's one of those things that is not going to hamper us because our Lion's Eye Diamond strategy happens on the spot when it goes off. So we're not too concerned about the upkeep cost on that. However, your opponents, if they're relying on fast mana via rocks, they're going to be hampered a whole lot. And again, we're relying on all of the dorks, right? So we have Elves of Deep Shadow in here. We have every dork you can imagine that's going to ramp us. So we don't really care that Kataki on the field. Again, it's just another thing that gets pumped as we go along. Fantastic card for this deck. Again, if you have green in your list and are able to avoid the two CMC rocks, I mean, this, this deck curve is so low. I believe it's 2.17 on average. 
we're not really hurting to push things out from our hand. We're not really hurting. This is also a reanimation strategy, so we can cheat most things out of our hand. So you can avoid two CMC rocks here, rely on just the basics and Kataki, and you're in a really good spot. Now I said we doubled down on this effect. Yes, there's rest in peace. Don't play rest in peace. Instead, play Leyline of the Void. For this deck in particular, again, we're using a reanimation strategy. We don't want to work against ourselves in too many ways to get our win out. So Leyline of the Void is too generic, too black for an enchantment. If Leyline of the Void is in your opening hand, you may begin the game with it on the battlefield. That's awesome. But what's it do? If a card would be put into an opponent's graveyard from anywhere, exile it instead. So it's like Dryad, Militia, Anafenza, all those static effects wrapped into one. It just says no to everything that's put into the graveyard. Samurai the Pale Curtain? Yeah, throw that in the mix too. I want everything that goes there to be gone. So any strategy that's going to rely on someone's graveyard or something dying, that strategy's gone. So Gidrog, it's gone. Your Flash Hulk lines, they're gone. It's really good effect. If you, I would, I don't know the percentage chance of this actually, maybe if one of you is a mathematician, you can tell me, I rarely get this out for free. I rarely get this out for free. I just never have it in my starting hand. Don't I wish I do though. However, whenever you get it, it's always valuable to play. I mean, there are basic things like flashback recursion. I mean, there's snapcaster mages that might want to recur, a counter spell, whatever the scenario is, having those effects go away permanently is fantastic. So you want to run Leyline of the Void. It not only shuts down combos, it's asymmetrical. Uh, again, rest in peace affects everyone. Um, it's the same thing as Leyline. Uh, the other benefit to rest in peace, if you don't know what that card is, it's two generic, uh, one generic, one white, excuse me. It ETBs and exiles all cards from all graveyards. So it does have that added benefit, mind you, but we can live without that for the most part, particularly if we're getting a spell that's free 10% of the time, I don't know, and for CMC the rest of the time and very easy for us to ramp out. Now the last stacks piece I wanna talk about, we've already mentioned, it is really good outside of Lin Vala and Elish Norn, Living Plane. Woo, there's a reason this card's expensive. It's a little over $100 and only had the one printing if I'm not mistaken. Uh, Living Plane, again, it's two generic, two green, all lands are creatures. So to get on the fast track to our combo working, which we're gonna talk about next, we need at least three lands. Bear in mind, this is if three lands, <laughs> one creature, and a Razaketh, right? And then we can win via a Blood Artist line and or a Bitter Ordeal line. We use a card called Life Death to get that combo rolling. Because again, we need creatures to sacrifice to Razaketh to do the tutors. And we just want to line up a few core cards to get this combo rolling. So with Living Plane out, we immediately have those creatures to sacrifice to Razaketh. So Living Plains out, the same creature we use to entomb Razaketh can be the one we sacrifice to grab the next card of our combo. So Living Plain, again, fantastic in this deck because it utilizes Razaketh as a win con, or rather a way to achieve our win con, um, but also it's great in tandem with some of our stacks elements, and it only benefits us. Again, so we're not hurting ourselves by playing Living Plain, we are hurting our opponents. Most people don't know how to react to it, and it's, it would be dumb, but some people, I mean, you could class them, you could destroy the board and kill everyone's lands. Again, I wouldn't, it would be okay. If that's what you chose, it would have to be okay because I'm playing a risky card. But it's going to hurt everyone else in the aftermath unless they have artifact mana and, and they're okay. So I generally refrain from playing Living Plane unless I know I'm in an advantageous position to really utilize it. It's not a great stacks element outside of its work in tandem with other cards, but you need it. Do play it. It's a smart choice. So going into our end game here, we've talked about how we want to grind out the game. Obviously there's a lot of elements in this list. Again, that some we didn't even mention that are more common, but those are the core cards in my opinion. Archon of Valor's Reach, always go for it. Another creature you should be going for that's underplayed is Orn Frostfang. 
always be going forward. Again, this is a creature of matter list. And I just want to go over Orn Frostfang really quick. If you haven't seen this card, it's sort of silently released. We talked about it, Ernesto and I, in our set review for this, um, uh, this not a set. Uh, it was like a pre-con of some sort. But Orn Frostfang is a three generic, two green snow creature snake. Attacking creatures you control have death touch, and whenever a creature you control deals combat damage to a player, draw a card. I've drawn so many cards off of this guy. Too many cards. Super good. Um, one of the best draw engines in this deck. So, horribly underrated. Use him as well. Highly recommend it. Howdy, neighbor. Now let's talk about the end game. So, if you're like me, uh, you love doing fast combo, and you like winning through some form of infinite line. So, I didn't want to leave that out of this list, despite the fact that I generally just go to Beat Street with it. I love just turning sideways with this deck. It's very easy to get a win that way. But... I say easy. It's a slog. But you're always going to come out on top. Generally speaking, you're in a good place. So with Rosketh, as I said, one creature, three lands, you can either kill the board out with Blood Artist or uh, draw step demise them with Bitter Ordeal. So if you don't know what Blood Artist is, it's a good stacks element by itself. Um, so if you read this carefully, you'll notice that it works off of other players' actions as well. But Blood Artist is a generic and a black. For a creature vampire, whenever Blood Artist or another creature dies, target player loses one life and you gain one life. So, any creature dying, if it's a part of their strategy, it's a part of yours now. You're gonna <laughs> make them lose life and you're gonna gain life. And Bitter Ordeal, one of my favorite cards in Magic. Again, Storm is very... It's, it's not an unseen strategy in CDH outside of... And I mean outside of the Fishbowl, Aetherflux Reservoir. That's Storm, but it's not really, it's not using the keyword Storm. But Bitter Ordeal is Grave Storm. So search target player's library for a card and remove that card from the game. Then that player shuffles his or her library. Play it early. Play it as soon as you get it. Play it when a bunch of these triggers happen. So when you play the spell, copy it for each permanent put into a graveyard this turn. You may choose new targets for the copies. You just cast a Bane of Progress. You got three mana left over. Play Bitter Ordeal. Literally, it doesn't have to be part of the winning plan, which would be to make an infinite loop with your Lean and Relic Water and your Animate Aura to do this infinitely. But if you just remove core pieces of everyone else's combo, one, the board's going to hate you. Totally fine. But you can also remove elements of removal that they might have for you for a particular stacks piece you have set up. Whatever you can target and remove from your opponents, this affects them in a huge way. Because not everyone has a way to retrieve something from Exile. And even if they did, make that part of the Gravestorm. Bitter Ordeal is fantastic. It's one of those underplayed cards. It's, it's a value card in and of itself, and it can also be used as a win condition. So, I'm going to try to, because I... There are Razaketh reanimation loops that utilize Eternal Witness and Lion's Eye Diamond and constantly reanimating your Eternal Witness for the Lion's Eye Diamond and building up a threshold of mana with the LEDs. Um, we're not doing that here. I believe Shaper Savant and a few others have sort of worked that sort of graveyard reanimation strategy out. Um, I'm not going to say this is wholly original. I'm sure that someone's come up with these combo lines before, but this is something I sat down and tried to make most efficient. So let's start with how you can win the game with Bitter Ordeal line of play. Now, bear in mind, I mentioned this here, but the most important thing to note is that the combo lines that we're going to discuss assume that all the mana spent during the, uh, all your mana, so from your mana pool, your dorks, is spent during the setup. So functionally, everything we're doing is going to rely on Lion's Eye Diamond. Of course, these combo lines can change depending on the board state, depending on your hand state, but again, with that bare minimum of Razaketh, land, and uh, three lands and one creature, you should be good. So let's start with the Bitter Orgeo line of play. We're gonna go ahead and bury Razaketh, and we can do so via Entomb, Buried Alive. If we use Buried Alive, you should also be burying Lean and Relic Water and Eternal Witness, who we'll get to later. We can bury Razaketh via Fauna Shaman, Survival of the Fittest, or Lion's Eye Diamond itself, should it be on the board. If you were to go that route, I highly encourage you to make sure you activate it for three green and also have loyal retainers out. Do not bury Razaketh and the rest of your hand 
with LED if you don't have loyal retainers out. So you can reanimate Razaket at this point. You're gonna do that with either Necromancy, Dance of the Dead, and or Animate Dead. That loyal retainers, who we mentioned already, or reanimate itself. We do have one more reanimation spell, but we're not gonna use that here. With these combo lines in particular, if you were to use Buried Alive, you do need five mana on deck for this strategy to work. So just bear that in mind. Buried Alive, you're gonna need a little bit more mana on deck. So maybe you have an Ancient Tomb or a City of Traitors in this list. When you activate Razaket's ability for the first time, you're gonna kill the one creature you have out. So that one creature's gone. It was just a dork. Let's just say it was Elves of Deep Shadow, right? Elves of Deep Shadow was used to cast Reanimate on the Razaketh. It's gone now. You're gonna tutor for life death. I'm going to cast life death to elect to cast it for life, making all of your lands 1-1 one, one creatures, just yours. Life death is a split card. It is one green for life, one generic, one black for death. This is the other reanimate spell I was talking about, but essentially works the same way as reanimate does. You will lose life uh, equal to its converted mana cost. But again, we only want life here. We do need this for this uh, few resources on deck. When you activate Razaket's ability for the first time, you're gonna sacrifice one of your lands and you're gonna grab Lean and Relic Warder. And if you're following along, there's gonna be a breakdown of all the mana needed, all the cost, but I'll encourage you to follow along on the tapped out primer. When you activate Razaket's ability again, you'll get Lion's Eye Diamond. So if you're following along, you have Lean and Relic Warder in your hand, Lion's Eye Diamond in your hand, whatever else you might have had in your hand from that turn, and one land on the battlefield was Razaketh. Go ahead and cast Lion's Eye Diamond, activating it for three green. Activate Razaketh's ability to grab Eternal Witness. Now, after we've cast and activated our Lion's Eye Diamond, our hand is empty. So at this point, we just have Eternal Witness and three green mana. Cast Uit to retrieve Lion's Eye Diamond. Cast Lion's Eye Diamond again and activate it for three black mana. Activate Razaket's ability, sacrificing the Eternal Witness to tutor for Animate Dead, Dance of the Dead, Necromancy. Go ahead and cast Animate Dead, Dance of the Dead, or Necromancy targeting Lean and Relic Warder. When Lean and Relic Warder enters the battlefield, have it target the Animate Aura to begin looping Lean in for an infinite loop. So when Lean and Relic Warder enters the battlefield and targets an Animate Aura, there is a loop that happens. If you've seen our video on Kambal, we use the same loop there, but essentially it will exile the enchantment that's bringing him back from the dead. There is a delayed trigger because of the enchantment. If it was ever removed from the creature, you bury that creature. So he will go ahead and get buried due to that. But now we know that because he left, he can bring back enchantments from our, uh, that, from exile that were exiled with him that uh, Animate Aura is gonna hit the field again, bring him back, and we'll keep targeting the Animate Aura with Lean and Relic Warders. Just bounce that in and out of play and bounce him in and out of our grave. So once you've done that a sufficient amount of times, you're gonna end the Lean and Loop targeting Eternal Witness. Eternal Witness is going to go ahead and grab Lion's Eye Diamond. At this point, you're gonna cast Lion's Eye Diamond again and activate it for three black. So we just have three black mana in our pool. Activate Razaket's ability, sacrificing Eternal Witness one final time to grab Bitter Ordeal and cast Bitter Ordeal. Woo, that was a cool 16 steps of play, but you can see how everything is made possible with one creature, three lands, and the line of play we just established. Again, Buried Alive makes things a little bit trickier. You will need an Ancient Tomb with the black, right? So you can do uh, your Swamp or whatever dual land you have out, Ancient Tomb, play Buried Alive. Again, bury those three creatures, Eternal Witness, Lean and Relic Warder, and Razaketh, and you have two mana available. At this point, you will need at least one green and one black in your pool to get this line of play going. So reanimate Razaketh, life for one green. That's your one green, that's your one black, and you can get the ball rolling. So that one requires a little bit more mana than the rest of lines of play. Also, I would never encourage you try to start this with necromancy because again, that's gonna require more mana on the battlefield. And again, at turn three, you, you might have another dork out, you might have your mana crypt out, things are gonna change. But the Blood Artist line of play is a little bit trickier to set up um, I haven't found a clean way to do this, and maybe you guys, if you know a better way to get this line of play going, let me know. But you're going to follow the same steps we did with Bitter Ordeal uh, from 1 to 11. So steps 1 to 11 up to activating Razaketh to get the lean and loop going, and then you're going to diversify that line of play as such. So you're going to cast Animate Dead, Dance of the Dead, or Necromancy targeting Leonin Relic Warder. Have Leonin target the Animate Aura. 
Now, with the Animate Aura's delayed trigger on the stack, you're going to go ahead and sacrifice Lean and Relic Water to Razaket's ability. Yes, you are allowed to do this, and fortunately, it's going to allow for the same result. When you sacrifice him, activate Razaket's ability to tutor for Blood Artist. Then, Animate Aura will re-enter the battlefield, just as it did earlier, target Leon and Relic Warder. You're going to repeat steps 2 through 4 here. That is, again, sacrificing Leon and Relic Warder and tutoring for another item. In this instance, you are going to tutor for Monocrypt, Mox Diamond, and any land. Now, end the Leonin loop by targeting Eternal Witness, who should be in your grave at this point, and you are going to retrieve the Lion's Eye Diamond. Cast Mana Crypt and Mox Diamond. You should have three mana on the board with this, right? And this is without mana in our pool from Lion's Eye Diamond. Cast Blood Artist with that mana. Cast Lion's Eye Diamond to activate it for three black mana. Now, activate Razaket's ability again, sacrificing the Eternal Witness to tutor for any remaining animate auras that are in your list. Cast that animate aura, targeting Leon and Relic Warder, to begin the loop. Opponents lose the life loss. Again, board states change so much of this. If you cast Buried Alive, you'll notice that my lines of play included ways of tutoring for certain creatures within the line. If Buried Alive was your tutor, you don't need to sacrifice lands to tutor for those creatures and put them in your grave. You've already done that. So if you buried alive and you have your three lands left, all you really need to do is make sure you have the mana sufficient to go off at this point with either one of these lines of play. So if I buried those three creatures, I can just use the reanimate spell, even death at this point in some instances to just bring back Razakath, kill one of those, the dork, the dork we have, kill the dork to get a reanimate aura and then begin looping the tutor cycle as we did in the blood artist line of play to get any other elements you're missing so obviously if one of those elements is in your hand like lean and relic water it's okay to cast lion's eye diamond and dump the lean and relic water you want it in your grave anyways so go ahead and do that eternal witness same thing totally fine you can dump the eternal witness and still work through these play lines you just need to get a way to reanimate your eternal witness and you'll actually be up on mana this way too so let's just say that we get our animate dead and we animate dead on eternal witness that was two um one generic one black so two mana total eternal witness is going to grab the led because we dumped it with the led we're going to go play the led and use it for i don't know three black mana and we can continue to sacrifice eternal witness and grab reanimate auras to bring her back and make mana strictly off of the lion's eye diamond because if i were to get a different reanimate aura dance of the dead reanimate her grab the led you'll notice that we've only spent two of the three black we produced with that first lion's eye diamond so i'm going to keep going up mana every time i reanimate her and grab that rock there are ways to manipulate these lines of play to work in your favor depending on the board state your hand state of course, if any of these play lines are missing, you're going to <laughs> resolve other effects to get the ball rolling instead. You know, if one of these combo pieces has been exiled, um, I don't believe we're on Pull from Eternity currently or the Rift Sweeper currently. If you're concerned about this combo being stopped due to some sort of exile element, or if it's just exiled consequentially to someone's rest in peace, then you're going to go back to what I consider plan A, an offensive. So use your plan A. You want to go to Beat Street. For the most part, in most of these games, it's going to devolve to you beating down the rest of the board. I, I don't highly recommend you go for the Razaketh line of play because it is very difficult to accomplish anything that's all in, like Lion's Eye Diamond, where you have no hand left. I would definitely recommend you have a Grand Abolisher out and or have cast a Silence effect first, right? So this combo line of play it's good it's there none of these cards are bad outside of the combo line all of these cards are good so don't worry about having them in your list the combo is there for you but again plan a is anafenza the foremost you should be working on building a stacks laden board state drawing massive cards with timna with orin frostfang getting a healthy hand size and just beating down opponents and if it comes to it and you want to end the game early use Razaketh and the Lion's Eye Diamond play line to crush them. Again, this deck is super fun. 
I love that there's a combo element baked into there, but honestly, I enjoy playing this for damage, and it's very easy to damage people out with this list. I know it's crazy to hear me say that, but you know what? It, if it works for Balan, it can definitely work in Abzan. And this is easily one of my favorite lists to date for the unique nature of its commander. It does stop a lot of strategies, and people don't realize her effectiveness on board until she's cast. It is very damning to face Anafenza by herself, let alone a whole list that's meant to hamper your deck style. I really enjoy this list. If you have an Anafenza list, let me know in the comments down below. I would love to see it. Maybe we can compare notes. If you enjoy this list and want to make it, please let me know. I love it when you guys tell me you've played one of my lists, you won a tournament, you won a local game, or you just wanted your kitchen table and you're having fun with it. I love hearing those stories. That's why I take the time to build these lists. But yes, if you wanted Anafenza the foremost in your roster, totally worth it. If you wanted to play with a Raza, uh, Raza Keth reanimation loop like I did, a Raza stacks loop, I would highly encourage this be to commander. She's great for it. She's very good at setting up the board state where you want it. And she doesn't hurt you in any instance uh, while you're going off. So love the deck, love playing it. Again, if you want to purchase any of the cards, if you're, if you're not hurting and you want to purchase any of the cards, I encourage you to do so through TCG Player, not only because it helps the channel, but they do have the best prices. I just picked up a bunch of singles from them recently because, again, that aggregate component, everyone is looking at everyone else's prices and they're competing for the best price, which only benefits us, which is really great if you're down financially. This is a good way to get those cards. There are other services that sell cards. Maybe they get you quicker. Maybe they get you in a nicer envelope. Um, that doesn't really matter to me. I kind of care about playing the game and I want to do so with as much dime in my pocket as possible. So definitely use TCG Player for your next purchases. And I would love it if you used our service. Again, Patreon if you want to hook us up. You can also go to Anchor. I hope you guys enjoyed the podcast element of this. Let me know <laughs> in the comments. Uh, on Anchor? I think you can message me on Anchor. Uh, this is my first time using it. Let me know if this translated well to podcast. Of course, I'm going to try to update this as I go along to make sure that it's the best experience for you. So to those listeners on Spotify, on Anchor, um, let me know if there's any sort of issues for you guys in translating what was said um, to paper. You know, make sure that you understand what's going on with this deck tech. I, I was contemplating not doing deck techs via podcast, but I think it is a good spot for it regardless, and I think it's easy enough to translate what's going on. So, But do let me know if there are any issues with that. Guys, thank you for joining me here. Join me also on Instagram, Twitter, Discord, the whole crew's there. If you have any questions for us, just look for the overlords in the Discord. They can answer any of your questions on decks, on cards in particular, and we have a bunch of channels for people, not only in the Patreon tier, but folks they can just generally mingle on our channel for booze, for food, and of course for MTG related content. So thank you guys again for joining me today. I hope you enjoy Anna Fenza. Let me know when you make your list. I really want to see it. Happy brewing babies. Oh, gonna take care of you. oh hey, you're still with me? My shirt? Oh, I'm so glad you asked. If you are a swag daddy like myself, and enjoy monocolored lists, feel free to let me know in the comment section down below if you would be interested in the 99 merch. Maybe we can hook you up.